When it comes to these, this issue of, of peace and conflict, we have to pay attention to the ways in which climate issues are being overlooked uh, and so the problems are not being correctly identified and it's exacerbating conflicts in many regions, particularly where we're seeing the result of the climate crisis. Good afternoon and welcome everyone to Facing Future TV and the Climate Toll of War and Peace as a Climate Action Program live from COP28. This session takes a deep dive into the intricate relationship between conflict, peace, and the profound implications for climate action. Our esteemed panelists will explore the climate impacts of conflict and underscore the fundamental importance of peace as a catalyst for effective climate action. Join us as we delve into the intersection of climate and peace, examining how climate action not only responds to, but also fosters peace, both in principle and in practical terms. The dialogue will span diverse topics, ranging from their carbon footprint of military activities to resource exploitation during conflicts, and with a special emphasis on practices for regenerative agriculture and to contribute to the creation of sustainable peace. Together, we will unravel the broader implications of the global environmental and climate goals, forging a path forward of harmonious coexistence of climate action and lasting peace. My name is Carlos Garcia. I'm the Vice President of Impact and Partnership for the Astra Project, and my co-host, Raya Salter. I'm Raya Salter. I'm a host with Facing Future TV and the founder and executive director of the Energy Justice Law and Policy Center uh, based in New York. And now we will do an introduction of our esteemed panelists. All right, so we are joined by three experts in this area. First, we'll hear from Tamara Lawrence. She is a PhD candidate in global governance from the Basili School for International Affairs. She also has an LLB, JD, and MBA specializing in environmental law and management. She's a member of the Canadian Pugwash Group, the Canadian Voice for Women for Peace, and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. We will also hear today from Dr. Amara Enya, she is a strategist and public policy expert on city and state policy, as well as international affairs with expertise in Africa, Latin America, and Central Asia. She serves as the director of policy and research for the Movement for Black Lives, and is also the chairwoman of the International Working Group for the United Nations Permanent Forum on People of African Descent, and chairwoman of the Working Group on Global Economic Systems, Institutions, and Policy. And last but not least, we will hear from Mr. John Liu, a filmmaker and ecologist, as well as an ecosystem ambassador for the Common Land Foundation. As a journalist, ecological researcher, and ecosystem ambassador, he has traveled extensively throughout the world and is sort of known as the Indiana Jones of ecosystem re restoration. Right. So first, why don't, uh, please, will you uh, go ahead and share with us tomorrow? Good afternoon, everyone. It's really nice to be with you, and I'm glad that we're having this uh, conversation on climate change, conflict, and peace. I would like to talk quickly about three points. The first is the emissions from war and militarism uh, are overlooked at this conference of the parties. And it has been for many years, and that's because in 1997 at the Kyoto Protocol negotiations, the United States ensured that military emissions were not part of the Kyoto Protocol, that they would be exempted. And so this problem of emissions from war and militarism have been really ignored for the past 25 years. But we know that for all countries, the largest public institutional consumer of fossil fuels is the military. So the fact that this continues to be ignored is a huge problem, particularly uh, for adaptation. And if we think right now about the wars in, in Gaza, in Ukraine, in Somalia, in Congo, in, um, in, in Sudan, and think about the emissions from these wars, the use of tanks, of fighter jets, of warships, you know, how they are exacerbating the climate crisis. 
Two British NGOs have estimated that global military emissions account for about 5%. This is an underestimate, but this is a huge part of the problem. The other point that I want to make is that one of the key priorities at this conference is the issue of climate finance, but an area of public funding that is being ignored in the conversation is military spending. According to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute last year, global military spending reached its highest level ever of $2.2 trillion. But it's the 31 countries of NATO, led by the United States, that accounts for 60% of global military spending. But this is exactly the amount of money that we need for the just transition for renewables to get off fossil fuels. And then finally, I want to say quickly that we know that one of the most important climate solutions is peace for cooperation. If you read the sixth assessment report that came out in March, you will see that one of the things that they highlight is that international cooperation is the crucial enabler for ambitious climate adaptation, mitigation, and resilience. In order for us to have that international cooperation, we need peace, we need to end the wars, and we need to cooperate on tackling our greatest uh, human security challenge, and that is climate change. Thanks. Thank you so much for reminding us there's the massive amount of energy consumption, right, within the war industrial complex. You know, like, as you mentioned, from the fuel usage to the war fleets, I think something overlooked as well is energy consumption, right? Um, when military bases go into these war trotting countries, the demand that it puts on already weakened grid, and in some cases, grids that are being attacked, right? Um, it, it's an idea and a, com and, and, and a topic that not many people want to think about, um, but that you very much so pointed out that we should, right? So, um, Dr. Mora, help us understand these issues from a transnational security and sustainability aspect. That, that's your expertise in policy, the international affairs. Help us understand, put this in context for us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thank you both for hosting and for these initial comments, which I think are the perfect opener for this panel discussion and talking about militarism and the toll of militarism on the loss of life, but also the, the extraordinary amounts of spending that are going toward uh, expanding uh, military bases that are going to wars, while we see at the national level in many countries basic needs not being met. And I think it's important to highlight the discrepancy between what is spent on war, which is actually fueling the climate crisis, versus what is actually spent on ensuring that people within their countries have their basic needs met, what they need to survive, whether it be housing, access to jobs, access to health care. Uh, and this is something that is, that is causing uh, increasing unrest at the grassroots level. Anyone who is aware is, is hearing the resistance and the pushback against how much is being requested for war, even as we are facing challenges uh, domestically. The second point that I think it's important to bring up is that we cannot have the kind of peace that we talk about with the existing economic discrepancies uh, around the world. And so issues of monetary sovereignty, of economic sovereignty, particularly when we look at the challenges that so many countries have faced under the existing global order, where they are stressed by debt that they can never hope to repay. This has been a challenge in many African uh, countries where the money that should be going toward ensuring high quality, uh, high quality life is actually going to pay down debt. Where when we experience shocks, for example, in the United States, inflation, it, it hits other countries whose economies are tied to the dollar uh, in extraordinary ways. And so when we talk about peace, it's not just in the context of, of an ending war, but it is in the context of what does a high quality of life mean and how do we change the systems and structures, specifically the global financial architecture that has actually exacerbated conflict and has created untenable circumstances, particularly in the global south. So that economic component is extraordinarily important. And third, this notion of, of conflict and obscuring the true uh, causes of conflict. When we look at the climate crisis, for example, uh, in Africa and the Sahel region and the expanding Sahara, what we're seeing is that in many instances where actually climate issues are being characterized as ethnic issues or religious issues or 
what are actually climate issues are exacerbating what may be ethnic tensions uh, or religious tensions. And we've seen this a lot. So with the Sahel, with the Sahara expanding south, uh, we're seeing some of the nomadic groups that, are, that live in the region having to come further and further south into other regions for their livelihood. And what's happening from there is that there we're seeing some clashes and conflicts in those areas. But it's not being characterized as a, as a climate issue, that climate issues are actually security issues or can easily become security issues. Instead, we fall into the usual tropes of these are just you know, ethnic conflicts or religious conflicts. And that's quite dangerous because it, it means that they are ignoring the root cause of many of these issues. And so the interventions will not be appropriate. The interventions will not be fit uh, fit for purpose. And so when it comes to these, this issue of, of peace and conflict, we have to pay attention to the ways in which climate issues are actually uh, obscuring or th to where climate issues are being overlooked uh, and so the problems are not being correctly identified and it's exacerbating conflicts in many regions, particularly where we're seeing the results of the climate crisis, whether in the Sahel region or even if you go to other regions where uh, expand where drought is causing conflict, where people who are more nomadic are having to travel farther and farther out for resources. We're seeing uh, in, in the Delta region, for example, in Nigeria, where the lands are being destroyed by oil companies, people whose livelihoods are based on the water are finding it harder and harder to survive. And so it, it has a compounding effect that can actually lead to additional uh, conflicts and crises. So those are the three biggest points when it comes to looking at the national level, but also looking at uh, transnationally, what are, what are some of these impacts? Thank you for bringing to our attention how we need to look at the root causes. Thank you so much for that. Um, next, uh, John Liu, if you could please share um, sort of how eco-restoration is an actual act of peace. Um, in China, we say uh, it's not a good thing if we're living in interesting times. <laughs> we're living in interesting times. So this means that we're required to face what's going on. And we have multiple issues. These issues are directly seen in the wars, but we have climate change, we have biodiversity loss, we have extreme and erratic weather events, hydrological disruptions, we're facing flooding, drought, wildfires, food insecurity, financial collapse, and all of our problems are interrelated. They're all pretty much the same. And the answer to them, while the problems are complicated, the solutions are not really complex. We need to restore all degraded lands on the earth, and it's possible to do this. We know how to restore degraded landscapes. I hope you'll all watch Hope in a Changing Climate, or Regreening the Desert, or Kiss the Ground, or uh, The Age of Nature, and there'll be a new film coming out about the rehabilitation of the Luce Plateau in the upper and middle reaches of the Yellow River next year. There, a desertified area of enormous scale that was desertified over thousands of years was restored. And we can see that it's possible to bring back hydrological function, to bring back food security, to bring back full employment. You can restore deserted, desertified landscapes. And it's not theoretical. It's not a policy issue. It's not simply about money. You need money, you need a policy that's enabling, but the real need is understanding and people to do the physical work. So it means that everyone in the region is engaged in ecological restoration. And when they do this, it is more valuable than anything else you could possibly do. Ecological restoration, functional ecosystems, are more valuable than anything that human beings have ever made, 
and everything that human beings will ever make because everything that humans create will eventually collapse. And the functional ecosystems are self-replicating. So they continuously renew. They create, constantly filter, and continuously renew the oxygenated atmosphere, the fresh water system, the fertile soils, and the biodiversity. And when everyone on the planet understands that, and we value it, we can have a shared understanding and a shared intention. And this is the way to make peace. This is the way to have everyone be in fully engaged, not employed, not having a few billionaires and billions of serfs working under them, but everyone on earth being free and autonomous and sovereign and having lands that don't belong to anyone because we're gonna die. We're walking on the bones of all the life that has ever lived on the planet. So we can't own the earth, the earth owns us. And this is what we need to understand and we need to ensure that future generations of life have fully functional ecosystems. And the way to do that is to restore all degraded lands on the planet. So watch those films, contact me <laughs> if you want to, and uh, happy to work with everyone who's in this. We are building ecosystem restoration communities around the world. It's growing really fast, and lots of people are, are working in them. John, thank you so much. And I think, yeah, please. And one of the things that I think we're, we're, we're constantly reminding how interconnected everything is, right? How a little beetle and the ecosystem of its survival is so vital to everything else, to birds and then to frogs and then to amphibians and how that connects to wildlife and, and ecosystems. And so, Dr. Meyer, I, I, one of the things that, that, that I always talk about is, you know, we have this thing called climate change, right? Think of it like a man with the scissors running around or a knife running around cutting everybody. And people want to put a Band-Aid <laughs> instead of stopping the man with the scissors, right? <laughs> That's, that's the way I kind of look at these things. And so you talked a little bit about the negative feedback loops that we have, right, with war. Um, can you put that a little bit in the context of what that looks like gender-specific wise? What is it like for men versus women versus children? How are these things kind of all interconnected? So, doctor, please. Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. I, I appreciate that question. I think uh, if we go back to, if we look at the um, cultural norms and ways of being and existing uh, of Africans, uh, and indigenous people, that notion of interconnectedness is it's a worldview. It's, just, it's, it's an understanding that informs how you build your society, how you build your systems, and how you build your structures. And so the attempt to put a Band-Aid on the climate crisis treats the climate crisis as though it is a discrete thing separate and apart from the way that human beings have come to live now. Mm -hmm. And I would say decided, but it hasn't been decided by the masses. It was decided by those who had the power to enforce a particular worldview on everyone else. And so we happen to live within that system, within those systems. And so it's not uh, the specific discrete intervention of, for example, carbon markets that's going to resolve the climate crisis. I would liken that to attempting to put the Band-Aid on the, the man with the knife, as you mm -hmm. described. It is a fundamental re-examination of how we, uh, how we live on this planet. And do we actually have a respect for human life, but also for plant life, for animal life, for all of the systems and structures that govern our existence? We cannot address the climate crisis without that. And what I've seen in so many um, conferences and gatherings is these attempts to sort of extract, uh, I guess, no pun intended, extract specific aspects of a crisis and try to address that, but we leave the really big picture largely unaddressed or the purview of you know, people on the fringes. We have to, these systems are all interconnected, right? So anyone, perhaps if you have a science background, you know how systems intersect. They are not separate and apart. The only way to address a climate crisis is to address it 
as a whole, understanding that all of these systems are connected to one another. It's why I lift up economic systems because so often we separate that as the purview of economists who largely have contributed to some of the thinking that has created the climate crisis, right? So we have to have a holistic view. Anyone who is working to adjust the climate crisis has to have a holistic view, even if your intervention is, is in a specific lane. As it relates to the gender component, Again, how we have decided that we are going to live on this planet. If we have systems that tend to, uh, to marginalize particular groups, uh, whether it's based upon gender or race or socioeconomic status, it means that we are accepting that they are relegated to a lower quality of life than everyone else. And that has often been the case for women. We just listened to a panel of, of African women talking about the interventions that they've done in their towns and villages around agroecology, seed sovereignty, food sovereignty. Why is that important? Because they are holding that work for their communities. They are holding the bulk of of that work for their community. So if we marginalize their voices, then what the woman was just explaining about how they are saving their seeds, reusing their seeds, that knowledge is lost. And so it just speaks to the importance of having an inclusive vision, that our systems change has to be inclusive, that it has to include gender, it has to include race, it has to include socioeconomic background. We cannot start to parse out who gets access to climate solutions or whose voices or whose thinking is prioritizing climate solutions and those who aren't. And I would end to say that it's precisely because we've had this exclusionary vision of who gets to build these existing systems that we're in this climate crisis. Because see, if we had actually valued uh, the voices of our indigenous people, the voices of those who believe in Ubuntu, the voices of those who actually see the connectedness of our systems and, and honor life in general, perhaps we wouldn't be here. So it's all the more important that we start to look to particularly those fo folks and those voices who have been marginalized to help us find the way out of, out of the crisis. Doctor, I think you know, the one thing that, that has been made clear to me, I think, since college, um, statistically, when women succeed, we all succeed. When women get educated um, in a country, the country does better writ large. Um, and war and climate change has a negative impact more so than anyone else on women and children. And so we have to look at this also from the lens of gender equality, right? How do we fix this? What are the, what are the levers? What are the friction points? Um, and how do we make things go smoother and more efficiently? So um, I, I, as always, I agree with you. Um, tomorrow, <laughs> New climate initiative from the from um, uh, COP. So tell us, tell us about how that's going to break this negative loop and negative externality cycle. Yeah. So I'd like to bring to your attention initiatives that have taken place coming from the top and then also coming from the grassroots, trying to bring peace into the COP space and into these climate conversations. So last year at COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh, the Egyptian presidency announced a new initiative called Climate Responsiveness for Sustainable Peace. And then that paved the way for the UAE presidency over this past year to try to do more work on bringing peace into COP. So this year, for the very first time, we had uh, peace on the thematic program, and that was yesterday alongside health, relief, and recovery. Peace was on the agenda. And in a high-level event, the UAE presidency announced a new declaration for relief, recovery, and peace, and a package of voluntary solutions. Now, this is something that's outside of the formal negotiations. It's voluntary, and it is targeted to conflict-affected communities and countries that are even more adversely impacted by the climate crisis because of the state of conflict that they're in, and so trying to direct resources and programs to them. 90 countries signed on to this declaration and about 40 NGOs, uh, including UN organizations, signed on to this declaration. So that's something that's encouraging. That, and that, that's coming from the, the top level. And at the grassroots level, last year, uh, under the Women Gender Constituency, which was is one of the con constituencies under the UNFCCC, 
established a demilitarization and peace working group. And so over this past year, again, women have been working together to try to bring uh, peace, disarmament, demilitarization into the climate space, you know, saying that we need to demilitarize, to decarbonize. Um, and I want to just end with something that the uh, foreign minister from Colombia said at the high level panel yesterday, and that is he, he emphasized that we need global peace for us to work collaboratively on on uh, dealing with the climate crisis. So let's heed his words, let's heed the work of the women and the indigenous people who are trying to get uh, you know, peace on the agenda, disarmament and demilitarization. Uh, that's the work uh, ahead for us. Thanks. Thank you so much for that. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Carlos. And we also want to give thanks to the International Society for Ecological Economics. Uh, thank you so much for coming to this program. Uh, and we'll see you next time on Facing Future TV. Thank you.